Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's presentation. It's one of my favorites. I've always loved the UCLA Planetarium. And although they're not doing in-person events and activities, I thought it'd be really cool to have this um, private planetarium showing. So I want to introduce Lenny, who is a grad student studying X-ray observation of black holes and active nuclei. I think I got that correct. Mostly. Mostly. Okay. All right. Um, my apologies, but please tell us about your background, um, your studies at UCLA, and then we can start whatever presentation we're doing today. Yeah. So I'm an astronomy grad student at UCLA, and I work with uh, an advisor at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory on studying supermassive black holes and the active glycogen nuclei they power using X ray astronomy. So, and that's why I've decided I wanted to give a talk to you guys today about active black nuclei so that you two can understand exactly why they're so fascinating and worth studying. It sounds amazing. I mean, I picked up maybe one word that I understood that you said, but I know um, there's lots of great stuff happening at the Jet Propulsion Lab. We did a virtual tour with them mm -hmm. um, at the end of last year. So we're really excited. So yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Um, let me see if I can share my screen now. Um, so, so basically today I'm gonna be giving a talk about active galactic nuclei. And just as an aside, I have a hobby of doing comics about astronomy. So you're gonna see some of my art here and there in this presentation. I hope you enjoy it. So basically you might be wondering at this point, what is an active galactic nucleus? Um, and act, active galactic nuclei are abbreviated as AGN by astronomers. And they are supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies that per produce an enormous amount of energy across all of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, you're probably from, you probably have heard of a galaxy before. They are the largest groupings of stars in the universe, and they are things like our own Milky Way galaxy that we live in, and the nearby Andromeda galaxy, and stuff like that. And the electromagnetic spectrum is just all the different kinds of light including the ones we cannot see, like radio waves, microwaves, infrared x-rays, and all that. But you might be wondering, what in the world is a supermassive black hole? Well, first we need to define what a black hole is, and we can start by defining what a black hole is not, and then drawing from that to tell what a black hole is. Oh, so the most popular, so like a popular idea of what a black hole is, is people think of them as like they're vacuum cleaners that are sucking in all the stars. But in reality, they don't, they're not like vacuum cleaners much at all. You can actually orbit them safely as long as you don't get really close to them. And in the real world, like black holes do not really get to eat that much most of the time because everything in space is so far away. And so, the, and they can't really pull it in. Mm -hmm. um, another misconception about black holes is people think of them as very dense objects, similar to uh, white dwarfs or neutron stars, which are, uh, highly dense stars that have collapsed in on themselves somewhat. Um, but in reality, black holes are actually vacuum everywhere. They're actually empty space time. They're not really objects as you, as you would think of them. And then sometimes you'll find bad artist impressions or cartoons where they draw black holes like they're literal 2D holes, mm -hmm. like a hole in a golf field. Um, <laughs> or, or sometimes people draw them like funnels but in reality, they're actually like spherically symmetric for the most part, like other celestial objects like planets and stars. Mm. And lastly, in uh, science fiction, you often see people fall, going into black holes with their spaceships and then exiting out into a different universe or other dimension or something. But in reality, if you go through a real black hole, there's no portal anywhere. You'll just die horribly. The mm. parts of the black hole solution that are have portals in them are actually wildly unstable so they don't exist in real life so then what exactly is a black hole really is what you might be wondering 
Well, a black hole is actually a region of extremely warped space time. And as you get closer to the black hole, space time becomes more and more warped. And you start having, um, you'll start having pad, the possible paths through space time will curve inwards towards the black hole. And once you reach this, cross this imaginary surface called the event horizon, all paths through space time actually lead further into the black hole. So when you're in a black hole, literally you cannot move any direction other than down. And no matter which direction you think you're moving, you're still moving down. And that's what gives a black hole its power. Its space time is so warped that it restricts the possible paths through space time that you can take. Um, another way you could think of a black hole is as a place where space is being sucked into it and falling faster than light. And the mathematics of this view is equivalent to the other view. And so the inward motion of space drags everything down through the black hole. And eventually we'll encounter something called a singularity, which is a place where space time as we know it ends. And we don't really know what continues beyond that point. But, for, but if you're thinking maybe there's still hope for survival, in reality, you'll experience very powerful forces on your way to the singularity and get ripped to pieces. So no, you're still gonna die. <laughs> um, so supermassive black holes are just black holes that weigh more than a million times the mass of the sun. And, for an, and they are found at the centers of galaxies. And as an example of the different sizes they can take, these are the sizes of the black holes in the galaxy OJ287. The smaller black hole is, about, is larger than Mars's orbit, which is pretty respectable, but the larger black hole in this galaxy is actually big enough to swallow the entire solar system. And the very largest supermassive black holes are tens of billions of times more massive than the sun and big enough to swallow the entire solar system whole. Um, yeah. the Milky, our own Milky Way galaxy has a supermassive black hole as well, but it's much smaller. It's only 4 million times the mass of the sun or 17 times the radius of the sun. So, but other galaxies, some of the other galaxies have really, really big supermassive black holes. So black holes by themselves aren't very much of anything. Like I said, they're empty space time. And it's actually been proven through mathematical theories that a black hole is only distinguished from another black hole by like three parameters, its mass, its electric charge, and its rotation. And so black holes basically have like no attributes by themselves. They're all pretty much almost identical to each other. And they don't really do much by themselves. But once they are actually feeding on matter and actually drawing matter in, they can get lot, exhibit lots of complex behaviors that we still don't fully understand. And up to 42% uh, of the mass energy of something you throw into a black hole will get released as energy. So they are the most efficient energy sources in the universe. Like for the record, like nuclear fusion, like in a star or hydrogen bomb only releases 0.7% of the mass energy of, of objects. So they are like the guy who really needs a lot of food to perform, but once they do it, they're like unstoppable. So that's why uh, us as astronomers, we like to study the black holes that are actively feeding because they exhibit a lot of interesting behaviors. And so when you have a supermassive black hole in a galaxy that's actively feeding, you get um, a wide range of features that will form around it. The, for, the matter that falls that's falling into the black hole gathers into this whirlpool of gas called an accretion disk, which then glows in, the, in light and UV light from its heat. Um, and just above the accretion disk are these regions called the corona, which are gas that's so hot, they emit in X-rays. And just surrounding the accretion disk is what's called the broadline region which is this area of gas that's moving very fast. And I've depicted it here as outflowing, but in reality, it can be, it can be inflowing or rotating. We don't really know for sure. And that gas glows in invisible light. There is also the narrow line region gas, which flows outward from the accretion disk in a big wind and then extends throughout the rest of the galaxy. 
And this also glows in visible light. Um, and then, sorry, I shouldn't have, now you can see the chat, damn it. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, the, uh, and so surrounding the black hole is this thing called the torrets. And this is basically a big ring of dust and gas that surrounds the black hole and its accretion disk and the broadline region. And depending on your viewing angle, the dust in the torus can block your view of all this stuff inside. And lastly, but not certainly not leastly, the corona lies at the base of these big two streams of matter called relativistic jets which are basically these like powerful beams of particles moving at close to the speed of light. And they can actually extend beyond the galaxy and start impacting the gas outside it. And we'll, so you'll see more examples of this in a few slides. So when we look out into the universe and look at active galactic nuclei, we don't always see all of the features that I just described. For instance, you have radio galaxies, which don't have a lot of the optical emitting stuff, but they have these powerful jets that glow very brightly in radio. And sometimes you have Seifert galaxies, which are, um, Seifert galaxies, which are basically galaxies where there is some light coming from the center of the EGN, where the optical light is made. And there's also these big, narrow line region clouds that are glowing in uh, optical light as well. Then you have some AGN that are so weak that you can barely tell them apart from stars like the Sombrero galaxy here. You can see that the core is brighter, but it's kind of hard to tell if that's just because of all the stars there or if there's really an active black hole that's feeding and making it glow. And then lastly, you have the brightest AGN, which are called quasars or QSOs. And these are so bright, they outshine their entire galaxy and just look like a star. So this point of light is a quasar. This one's just a regular star. And that right there is a galaxy that's much closer to us than this quasar is, but the quasar out still outshines it. The very brightest quasars are 100,000 times more luminous than the Milky Way is. Or alternatively, you can think of this as the energy output of 10 hydrogen bombs for every grain of sand on the Earth. So they are the most powerful sources of energy in the universe. So, so basically the hypothesis for why these different AGN look so different is the idea that they're unified by two things, the viewing angle and the rate at which the black hole is feeding. There are these AGN called blazars, which have very prominent jets. And it's thought this is because we are looking straight down the jet. Quasars and QSOs don't have jets that are quite as prominent as blazars, but they still are very, they still are very bright and outshine their galaxy. And it's thought that this is because we're looking at them at an angle and that, but that the EGN is very bright because the supermassive black hole is feeding a lot. Then there are Seifert galaxies, which are similar to quasars, but they're weaker. And so the black hole is not absorbing as much material. Radio galaxies are thought to occur when the black hole is absorbing a very small amount of material, but it's still enough to power these big jets. And so that's why you don't see a lot of uh, glow from the center and also because the torus is blocking your view. And then you are the liners, which are the weakest AGN. And that's where they're barely, the black holes are starving and barely able to eat anything at all. Of course, reality is more complicated than this, and you're free to ask me more about this in the Q&A sessions after the talk. Um, so that's a lot about why, what are active galactic nuclei and how they're structured. But then you might be wondering, why exactly is any of this important? Well, why is anything important? It's be, it is, things are important because of the effects they have on other things. And, black, and uh, the supermassive black holes and AGN are important because they actually influence the history of galaxies. So because an AGN can emit so much power, it can actually potentially drive out the gas in a galaxy and eject it all from the galaxy. Now this is bad because the gas in a galaxy is what collapses to form stars. So an AGN can actually stop a galaxy from being able to form new stars and replace the ones that die. 
Wait. Um, the, uh, the, and once this happens, the AGN can prevent the gas that's ejected from falling back onto the galaxy by, uh, by, cool, by basically the gas needs to cool to fall back down on the galaxy. But then what happens is that the jets from the black hole will inject energy into the gas and stop it from cooling. And so a, an AGN will not only basically keep a galaxy, stop a galaxy from forming stars, it will also, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sorry if you're seeing all of this. Uh, Sorry, I just need to, let's try this again. I'm so sorry. Um, okay. Um, and so people call this that sometimes refer to this as AGN kill galaxies. But in reality, the galaxy is not gonna go away for for trillions of years because stars live a long time. So there's the galaxies that have been quote unquote killed in this way still exist. They just don't form new stars anymore. So it's a very slow apocalypse. Like if you're a star, maybe the idea is terrifying, but if you're like a human, no, the galaxy is not gonna die before you die. It's pretty slow. But so we can actually go out into the universe and look at different AGN and see how they're actually doing this. For instance, in the galaxy NGC 3079, there are two giant bubbles that are being blown into the galaxy by the supermassive black hole. The bigger one is 4,900 light years across and the smaller one is 3,600 light years across. So these are very, very large amounts of high energy gas that's being ejected out into the galaxy. Um, we can also see galaxies with jets that carve out cavities in the outer gas. M87 is the galaxy that had that famous image of a black hole released in 2019. And you can see that there are shock waves and, and cavities being blown in the gas around the galaxy by the powerful jets. And this particular galaxy is actually even crazier because the cavities that are being blown into the galaxy's gas are actually big enough to fit the Milky Way inside. So we're talking about a phenomenon that has the power to blow galaxy-sized holes in things, um, which is absolutely incredible, as you can imagine. Um, we also sometimes see sound waves created by the jets of the, of the black holes as they, uh, as they eject energy into the gas of the galaxy. And these, this particular galaxy, NGC 1275, or Perseus A, has been found to have sound waves emitted by the emitted from the black hole that are uh, that are like a million billion times lower than the human ear can hear. So if supermassive black holes could sing, they'd have a really deep voice. <laughs> and we can even sometimes see the galaxies that have AGN in them impacting other galaxies. This is three C three two one, or it's sometimes called the Death Star Galaxy because. The, the black hole in this galaxy is launching a jet that's hitting another galaxy and causing it to like suffer being irradiated from all that energy and, um, and, and, all, and stuff like that. So sometimes, sometimes EGN don't just influence the galaxies that they're in, they can influence the evolution of other galaxies. So basically black holes can blow can basically like eject gas in such a powerful manner that they can like impact galaxies and even whole clusters of galaxies. So the next time you have indigestion, just be thankful you're not gonna be blowing holes in galaxies anytime soon. You're definitely not like a supermassive black hole. But the thing is, is that while I've been describing black holes like they're just really bad things that are killing off their galaxies, there's actually evidence they can also have a positive effect as well. Because as the jet plows through the gas, it will cause it to collapse and form into new stars. And so depending on the situation, an AGN can also help a galaxy grow by basically forming, by forming new stars. And so it's thought that galaxies in the ancient past would have been built a lot by their black, supermassive black holes. 
So maybe supermassive black holes are not really like monsters. Maybe they're more like beneficial, beneficial beings like the Eastern dragons of lore or something like that. But I don't know. I'm I'm still pretty scared of black holes. So I don't know. Definitely don't recommend getting close to any of them. So another reason EGN are important is because EGN can be seen from across the universe. Because we are so bright. And because light has a finite speed. Because light has a finite speed. You might have to um, pause and mute everybody. Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. I was, I was messaging people that we could hear them, um, but I don't think it went through. Okay. So I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think it'll yeah. be a lot better of a presentation if your people aren't having that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We're here. Yeah, we're Did you want me to leave it so to watch it on there? Yeah. Uh, oh, wait. Let me make sure that um, we get it. Okay. Right now, we've only got. Judith, can you mute yourself? Okay. We have this. So if you can mute everyone, I'll take. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So because light has a, a finite measurable speed, um, this means that when we look back into the faraway universe, we actually see what it looked like when it was a long time ago. So if you see like, so you can, so when we look back at EGN that are very far away, we're actually seeing them as they existed billions of years ago. And as the EGN light tra travels forward from its location to us, it will interact with clouds that are in that are it will interact with clouds that are in the the universe, and this will leave imprints on the spectrum of light that's emitted from the quasar. And so we can use quasars to find out about the chemistry and physics of clouds in the un distant universe when the universe was much younger, and so. Quasars and AGN are also important for telling us about what the universe was like a long time ago. The current furthest known quasar existed only 686 million years after the Big Bang. And it may just look like a dot, but this is a this thing existed when it was a fraction, of, the universe was a fraction of its current age. The universe currently is 13.8 billion years. Um, and so this is like very young by universe standards. And its black hole is 9 billion solar masses. And we don't, we don't really know exactly how it was able to grow so big in so relatively short a period of time. One of the current big mysteries in astrophysics right now is how did supermassive black holes form and how did they grow? And it's a very interesting topic of research right now. Um, one thing to note is that the very brightest AGN, the quasars and and QSOs and all that, they no longer exist. They only are seen very far away from us, which means that they had only existed a long time ago. Because as I've said, when you look into the universe, you're looking back into the past. We only see weaker AGN, like Seiferts and Liners in the nearby universe and the galaxies that are near us. And so because those galaxies are nearer to us, there hasn't been as much time since when we saw, when they when the light left them to when we see it and so those get those uh galaxies and so those galaxies tell us that agn are just not as powerful as they used to be and so the quasars are almost like these great prehistoric monsters that went extinct a long time ago and only have these ghostly echoes in the light to to tell us that they existed once and so in my opinion, active black and nuclei are the universe at its most ancient and most mysterious and powerful. And it is our duty as scientists to bear witness to these phenomena, to observe them and understand them. Because as far as we know, we might be alone in the universe and nobody else is doing it. When you think about just how vast the past of the universe is and just how much has been lost to time and we will never be able to know for certain what it is, the fact that we even have these beacons from a long time ago to tell us about what the past of the universe was like is really, really amazing in my opinion. And so to recap, 
Active galactonuclei are the result of supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies that are eating material and sending enormous amount of energy back out into space. There's many different kinds of active galactonuclei with some being more powerful than others and, and some being dustier or having more powerful jets. Um, they are thought to play an important role in galaxy formation and evolution because of the way their power feeds back onto the galaxies and influences them. And they can provide insight into universe beginnings. And in my opinion, they are the most awesome of all the space things. And that's the talk part of my presentation today. And if you want to see more of my really silly black hole art, you can check out quasarlazar.tumblr.com. Can you put the link to your um, graphics or the Tumblr in the chat and then we can share it afterwards? Yeah, sure. Great. Um, that was exciting. So I, I have a question that came through and I'll just, I'll read it off. And then if, if anyone has questions, then you can unmute yourself. Uh -huh. um, so what do you expect to see from the new web telescope? Um, That's an interesting question. It's not really, does it's not really going to be as much like as really that big of an AGN research instrument. It's more geared towards studying the earliest galaxies and uh, exoplanets, but it I presume it will be able to study more further away AGN because the very first galaxies may have had some of the very first AGN in them. Um, and I don't know if you guys have any other questions, feel free to ask me before I move on to the stellarium part of the presentation. Any other questions about this part of the presentation before we get going? Yes, I have a question. Yes. And um, I'm wondering if it's possible to see, uh, to understand anything other than uh, just the mass of the super, of the supermassive black holes, the angular momentum or the charge. Um, that has been something that people have tried to study about the black holes and tried to see if there are alternate theories of gravity that could show the black holes as having other features. But so far, everything we've observed about black holes is consistent with our current theory of gravity, which is general relativity. And that predicts that black holes have only three attributes. So there's so, and realistically, Black holes in the universe don't even have electric charges because if they get electric charge, they get neutral, they get neutralized by pulling in the opposite charge. So really there's only two real things you can measure about a black hole by itself, and that's its mass and its spin. And that's something that astronomers are doing a lot, but it's really like more of the black holes interactions with the matter around it that are interesting. Cool. Thank you. Okay. You can get started on the, the next part and then I'll keep the questions for okay. after that one. Okay. So this is Stellarium. It is a virtual planetarium that we will be using today to replace the, the real planetarium because we cannot do anything in person right now. And so, as you can see, it's set to the current local time, which is during the day. And we, so you cannot see any stars right now. But if we step forward in time, you can make it so that it will, this, that the sun will set and you will see, and you will see the night sky as it will look tonight. And so you can see that you have like some familiar constellations here like Orion the hunter and Canis major, the dog. And there is the, there's Canis minor, the little dog here. And Taurus is up here. Um, and you can see that like these constellations, they have, they, they have stars that make them up, but there's also like a lot of other features that you can find and look at. For instance, like there's this one area of Orion that's called the sword that has, um, that has this fuzzy splotch, but if you zoom into it, the Stellarium will actually show you what it looks like to say Hubble and stuff. And it's actually a big nebula called the Orion Nebula. And there's a lot of young stars that are forming inside there. 
And similarly, if we look up, if we look up to to uh, to Taurus, we can see that there's this cluster of stars surrounded by nebulosity. And these are called the Pleiades, and they are a uh, a young star, young cluster of stars that have recently formed. And if just as a fact of trivia, if you've ever wondered why the Subaru cars have a bunch of stars on them, Subaru is the Japanese word for the Pleiades. So that's actually a reference to that. Um, and one of the things that you'll also notice is if you look closely, there is a hazy band of light moving across the sky. And this is this is this is the ed, the disk of the Milky Way galaxy, which we reside in. Because it is shaped like a disk and we are inside it, it looks to us like an edge on line. And the and so a lot of the areas where like yeah, there's young stars that you can see on the sky, they follow the trace of the Milky Way because this is where most of the gas from which stars can form exist. And one of the things about Stellarium that's cool is we can look at some of the AGN that I talked about today and you can see where they are in the sky. For instance, at this time, which is about uh, 8.21 PM, M87, which was one of the galaxies that had the giant holes being blown in it, is not as below the horizon. But if we step forward in time, we can make, we get so that it will rise and you can see where it is on the sky, where it will be on the sky tonight. And if we zoom in, it'll show you like the optical image of it. And you can see it's a very big galaxy that doesn't have a lot of gas in it anymore, which is called a giant elliptical galaxy or CD galaxy, depending on how technical you want to get. Um, we can also look at the Sombrero galaxy, which is um, which is this galaxy that has that is a dusty disk and it has that bright core that is probably a mix of star emission but also some AGN emission. And um and like and then we can look at 3079, which is the galaxy that has the black hole that is blowing all the bubbles. And you can see that in this current optical image, you can't really see the bubbles. They are traced out in specific wavelengths of light. So you can't see them in all wavelengths. And one of the things, and so of course, this is what this, and of course, this is what the night sky would look like tonight. Um, this is what the night sky would look like tonight if there wasn't a lot of light pollution in LA. But of course, but of course there actually is. So we can turn up the light pollution level and see it, what it would look like actually if you are out in LA tonight. And as you can see, most of the stars are no longer visible. Um, or most of the stars are no longer visible. And that is a, and like one of the reasons why this is such a problem is that if you look at the constellations themselves, they record what ancient people thought about the night sky. And so the night sky is one of the bright, the last areas of the world that are, pub, that are not owned by anyone and is the common cultural heritage of mankind. And one of the nice things you can do about Stellarium is that you can choose like different, different, uh, you can choose different constellations from different different cultural groups. Like for instance, these are what the Mayans, these are constellations that we know that the Mayans created based on what was in the night sky. And you can also see like others like, um, some of them are not very uh, well recorded in this, in this app, so. But like, there's also like the Macedonia constellations in age from ancient Macedonia and stuff like that. And so one of the reasons why light pollution is really so tragic is that for most of human history, the night sky was, at, was a very common, common thing that people looked at every night because there were no artificial lights. And it's one of the big cultural heritages of mankind was all those things people saw in the night sky and they stored the stories and meet up about it. And and so, 
And so it's not just a, sci a loss for scientists when they're trying to observe gal galaxies and stars and we, they can't see them anymore due to light pollution. It's a loss to the common cultural history of mankind. And there is an organization called the International Dark Sky Organization that if you want to look up more about how to stop light pollution, they have um, a very uh, big, uh, they have a very lot of information about that. Um, and that's really all I have for now. Is there anything else you guys would like to see or something or questions you'd like to ask me? So where is the solarium? Is it locally in Los Angeles? Yeah, this is, this is uh, showing the view of the sky locally from Los Angeles. And it's on, it's, it would be at, this is at 10.55 PM tonight. Wow. So do you, can you see other, like say we were in Joshua Tree, you could see more of the sky. Does it matter where this is in Los Angeles? Um, you, uh, it's by default, it shows you the, what the, by default, it shows you um, like what the, what are the, what the sky looks like without a lot of light pollution. So this is more like something you would see out of like Joshua tree, but it doesn't, but it doesn't automatically take what the light pollution levels um, are at a different, um, at different uh, locations are, but you can uh, change the location. So for instance, if we go to like, we can go to like, um, Ooh. We can go to this, we can go to like a place in the Southern hemisphere, like Australia. And then if we step forward in time, you'll see that the stars we'll see are very different because the Northern and the Northern and Southern hemispheres of the sky have different stars in them. And if we like put the, put the constellation labels, and the connecting thoughts. Um, I don't know why they're not showing up. I believe this is the Carina Nebula, but the labels aren't showing for some reason. I don't know what happened. Um, but that's a thing that you can only see from the Southern Hemisphere. Wow. And there's actually these two small satellite galaxies of the Milky Way the large and small Magellanic clouds. And these are basically dwarf galaxies that are orbiting the Milky Way. And you can actually see them on a dark sky in the Southern hemisphere, like they are clouds. And they look like they're, they very much look like they're clouds. So is the Stellarium something anyone can look yes, at? It's, yeah, it's a free download. It's a free download on, online. Okay, yeah, that was one of the questions if there's a link to the Stellarium. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll open it up for questions. So um, I'll have Lenny send me the link to the Stellarium and I'll follow up in a via email with people so they can have the link to the Stellarium and also her graphics from the Tumblr. Um, They're very weird, some of them, so don't get too weirded out. <laughs> <laughs> we like weird. Um, great, so any other questions you have for our speaker today about tonight's sky and Anything else with the planetarium or her studies? Oh, there's the link. Um, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand if you have a question. Um, Hi, I, I have a question, if you can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, which, which AGN is your favorite? That's a, that's, a, on? that's a good question. I don't really have many favorites, but there are a few that I like more than others. Mm -hmm. Like I really like that uh, galaxy with the sound waves, which is also sometimes called Perseus A. It's one of the things that first got me into astronomy was just seeing this image of these big sound waves coming out from this black hole and it was just influencing the galaxy. And I just thought that was like so epic. Like what kind of power could blow holes in galaxies and make these giant waves? Um, I also really like, I'm also particular to an AGN that I've studied called PG-1302-102. PG and that one 
is most likely a binary supermassive black hole. So it's two black holes that are orbiting around each other, but still absorbing material and making it glow like an AGN. And we can tell this is probably the case because it shows periodicity in all the different wavelengths of light. And that one, I guess, is also something that I really like a lot. Okay, any other um, final questions? I guess I have one other question. Sure. Um, roughly, how many um, black holes are scientists looking at? I mean, sorry, um, astronomers looking at right now? A dozen? A hundred? Um, well, the, there's like, there's probably one supermassive black hole at the center of every large galaxy. So okay. however many galaxies there are in the universe, it's like that, it's about that much. And then, of course, there's smaller types of black holes, like stellar black holes, where you can have millions in a single galaxy. So there's a lot of black holes out there. I don't know the exact number. I'm just curious. Thank you. <laughs> Not a handful. <laughs> so more than 100. Yes. <laughs> billions. Billions. Okay. Billions. Even. Like there is an AGN catalog that I work, I've, I've looked at and it has something like 27 million AGN in it. So like, no, there's a lot of these black holes out there. Not a question, but just a comment. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, definitely. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah we, we've been wanting to do a program with the planetarium. We were hoping to have something in person, but the way the world is nowadays, who knows when that'll be. Um, okay, any final questions? Okay. Well, Lenny, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. Um, once we get this uploaded to our YouTube channel, I will um, share it with those who registered today um, so that you can go back and share it with your colleagues and friends. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Have a great Friday. Thank you.